Hello, welcome to security, cryptography, whatever. I'm Deirdre. I'm David. I'm Thomas. And we have a special guest today. We have Matthew Garrett. Hi, Matthew. Good evening. We're so grumpy. Hi, good evening to you. <laughs> Matthew's our special guest today because he's been doing some reverse analysis and reverse engineering on your Twitter.apks or whatever the extension is for iOS apps. Just browsing around to see what ye old Elon Musks are trying to deploy in your DMs. We just thought we would have a little bit of a conversation with him to see what he's been finding with the newly announced Twitter encrypted DMs. Note that I did not say end-to-end -end encrypted DMs. Matthew, do you just like decompile applications for fun and profit? I'll say that it's mostly not being profitable. <laughs> the amount of profit are a great deal, but uh -huh. most times I'm not actually making money out of this. Perhaps, sure. okay. unsurprisingly. But yeah, uh, it started off mostly as um, part of analyzing IoT devices and trying to write open source implementations to allow them to be integrated with things like Home Assistant. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out that if people don't document the protocols they speak, the uh, closest you're going to get to a source of truth is whatever the apps do. Yep, yep. Uh, cool, so that continued over to just I'm already in the flow of decompiling some apps that talk to Apple, or they might might be working on your Google device, and you're just ready to just open up whatever is landing on devices, the device near you. Yeah, so um, once you've got into the hang of figuring out what the uh, most straightforward approaches are to doing this, it's pretty easy to apply it to um, apps in other kinds of spaces as well. Mm -hmm. So you were already digging around in the Twitter apps. I'm on Twitter. I think you have been on Twitter as well. <laughs> and you just happened to notice when they started, I don't know, showing tokens in the decompilation results about end-to-end -end encryption, Signal. Yeah. So people had actually noticed last year that the Twitter app for Android contained various references to Signal. Uh -huh. um, there were various hints, you know, references to terminology that's used generally as part of the Signal protocol. Bits of code that clearly were intended to integrate with LibSignal, the, uh, mm -hmm. the reference protocol implementation. Mm -hmm. But then Elon suddenly announced that encrypted DMs would be coming soon. Um, mm -hmm. So the sort of natural assumption was, okay, well, they probably finished integrating that signal code. We should see more evidence of that. Because mm. the main problem with mobile apps, if you want to launch a feature on a specific day, it's not like you can just release a new version on that day, typically. Guessing yeah. things through the review process can take some time. And making sure that everything is lined up is not straightforward. So usually you're going to end up shipping the code early mm. and then having a feature flag to actually enable it. And that way you're also able to actually get testing of it. Mm. And you can turn the feature on for a subset of users. Everyone's carrying around that code, but they're not necessarily able to make use of it yet. Mm -hmm. So at the point where it's sort of, oh, we're expecting to ship this within the next few weeks, it's a good indication that the code is probably out there already. So yeah. I went in to look to see where this signal stuff was going. And I was kind of surprised to find out that there was, if anything, less in the way of references <laughs> to signal oh, no. that had been a few months earlier. Did the original LibSignal code show up before pre-acquisition, post-acquisition, but pre-launch of this some other time? I honestly, um, I don't know. There is an amount of code that is in there uh, that was very close to the acquisition, but the only versions I looked at were post-acquisition. Uh -huh. On the other hand, from pretty much everything I've heard, most, if not all, of the people who actually had worked on that signal integration were gone pretty early yep. in the Musk regime. Yeah. Although there were some people who had left and they poignantly posted on the internet when this got, uh, when part of your analysis got released. I left some design documents. I left some notes behind. Please read them. <laughs> but yeah, so 
There was mention of Signal in the past in these sort of teardowns and multiple reports that a prototype, proof of concept implementation using LibSignal in Twitter DMs had been done at least pre-Musk acquisition. But what did you find when you, with the thing that actually shipped this past week? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll start by saying that they did not invent new cryptography. Okay. Uh, the way we normally think of that. So that's a good start. We're talking about a case where uh, the code is making use of fairly well-tested cryptographic primitives. It's using not necessarily mm-hmm. best in class, but things that, you know, I kind of cosplay someone who knows something about cryptography. You <laughs> are much more qualified than me to make representations about this. And I had to enlist the aid of actual cryptography people to feel even vaguely confident about anything I'm saying here. So <laughs> if anything I'm saying here makes no sense, that's that's a me problem, not a you problem. <laughs> but there's two parts to this. Um, there's the symmetric encryption key that's used for the actual encryption of the messages. And that's a straightforward AES encryption in GCM mode. Cool. Um, All right. I'm told that's completely fine. Now, the one thing that is not handled there <laughs> is the same key is used for the lifetime of the conversation. What? And at the moment, <laughs> implementation the conversation is the conversation ID is the letter E followed by the sender's, the initial sender's user ID, a hyphen, and then the recipient's user ID, which means uh-huh. that will remain static for as long as my user ID is remain that's static. Been, that's been like part of DMs for a long time, right? Is that they're, I, they're identified by that string? Yeah. All the times you changed here is that they're prefixed with the letter E, I assume, to indicate Ooh. encrypted and differentiate them um, from existing conversations between two people. So you know, if you're able to somehow generate enough traffic with that key, you're potentially eventually going to have NOS reuse. And I'm told that's bad. I don't know. Yeah. Like I said. Earlier, it sounded like a non-Scott Thomas's tongue. And that joke fell flat because we lost Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, some sort of harumphing around the fragility of GCM, blah, blah, blah. I generally kind of uh, am in the same wheelhouse, but we've got bigger problems. We've got bigger fish to fry here right. than, worrying, than worrying about and- Elon Musk's hand chosen people hand rolling AES GCM. I'm not, I don't think they're doing that right now. So anyway. Right. So the actual crypto implementation appears to just be Bouncy Castle. So a fairly yeah. well used Java cryptography implementation. I'm going to pass zero judgments on how well implemented it is. That's mm-hmm. very much not my problem. So we have this AES stuff. Now the saving grace um, that makes it unlikely that you're going to see nonce reuse. And we'll see whether the mere mention of nonce reuse is enough for Thomas to fall offline again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> At the moment, there's no support for attachments. Yeah, yeah. No pictures, no videos. So you're only able to send plain text. The risk of you actually sending enough traffic to hit any sort of um, reuse is not super high. Mm -hmm. But also, like, we don't have to worry about correctly handling encrypted attachments because you can't attach anything. So. Well, the problem with the DM format is that the. this is very, very much layered on top of the existing formats in the simplest uh-huh. way possible. And the existing formats, uh, when you send an attachment, the attachment is uploaded to Twitter's CDN, and then a uh-huh. reference to that attachment is included in the message. So if you just naively enable encryption, you'd end up with an encrypted reference to an unencrypted attachment. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to handle that as well. And so they're like, nope, not doing it. So no attachments right. for signals you. Att- signals attachments are, they're not unencrypted. They're encrypted with a, like an out-of-band secret that's derived from your current session or whatever, right? But it's not like, it's not yeah. like you'd be sending, se- like you, it's not like you'd be sending attachments in signal under the raw GCM key of, you know, whatever your session was. I don't think they're using no. GCM either, but like, no, they're using AES CBC with HMAC. So it's authenticated encryption, but it's it's not GCM. So, okay, you've got this AES key and both ends have a copy of this key and you just encrypt 
a message with that and then you decrypt at the other end. And that's super simple. Mm. But the obvious question is how do both ends end up with the same key? Uh huh. And well, this is like the key exchange problem. We have, when I say we, I mean, I have no fucking idea how any of this works. But <laughs> apparently Diffie Hellman is this sort of magical thing where you say it into a mirror three times and, and then both the parties end up with a shared secret without either knowing this, as long as you have an asymmetric key pair to begin with. Mm -hmm. Of a certain variety and not to be confused with triple Diffie Hellman, which is a different saying Diffie Hellman into a mirror three times, which this implementation is not using. <laughs> this implementation is extremely not using triple Diffie Hellman. Um, <laughs> okay. But if I say this implementation is kind of what you might guess if you ask Stack Exchange to write you an mm. encrypted messenger protocol, I'd be super happy if my students wrote so, this. Um, <laughs> so tri triple Diffie Hellman is what you would use if you wanted to do an authenticated key exchange, right? So you have like you have the two problems of the key exchange, yeah. right? You want to um, you want both sides to share a secret and be able to encrypt to each other. And then also, ideally, you want to know if you're if I'm talking to user X with key Y, you'd like to be able to prove to yourself that you're actually like you've established a key with user X, right? So triple Diffie Hellman would matter if there was a notion of cryptographic identity that you were trying to work with, right? If you're just doing like a vanilla elliptic curve yeah. Diffie Hellman, then like a man in the middle can intercept and you know, just proxy Diffie Hellman to both yep. sides and make it look mm -hmm. like it's working, right? But I assume or there's like some kind of like middle. out of band mm -hmm. like key lookup thing going on here where you know what key you're supposed to be talking to. You're not being presented on the fly with new keys. The the weird yeah. thing here is like it's my understanding of this from the, the write ups and from uh what Steve Weiss wrote up and all that, right, was that the sender is generating an ephemeral key. Like they're just coming up with a key on the fly and they're using that to encrypt to the public key of the receiver, which is like a totally normal way to, you know, build, you know, like an elliptic curve Divi Hellman based, like right. I want to send a file from user A to user B. That's how you would do it, right? I think there is a reason cool. for that, which we'll get to when we start talking about multiple device support. At least that's <laughs> my assumption about why it's done this way. So each device, and when I say device, that includes a browser. Now, I mm. my initial assumption was that there wasn't going to be support in the browser for this because there were hints in the iOS clients that you could only have one active encrypted messaging device at once, and that seemed to preclude any sort of web management. Turns out I was wrong there. That code's never called, um, and we'll get back <laughs> to that later. Okay. But so every device generates a public key pair using the NIST P256 curves. All right. Um, like, those are not state of the art. They're fine. Uh, to the best of my understanding. I, I don't think there's... They're, they're fine. good curves, Brent. Yep. Um, but Not all, normally, but those ones are fine now, fine, whatever. It, the main reason people tend to use these curves is that they are what's supported by hardware implementations. So if you want to store your cryptographic keys in hardware, such that the private key can never be extracted, can't be copied if your device is rooted, that sort of thing. Uh, like TPM supports P256, the secure enclave on iOS devices and Macs mm -hmm. supports P256. Android devices with hardware key stores tend to support P256. And yep. they usually don't make support for the 25519 curves is generally much less common. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of weird to then discover that while they're using P256, they're just generating these keys in software and storing them in the local file system. Uh, in okay. the Android case, they're actually storing them as preferences which, as oh, far as I can tell, huh. means that if you uh, do a, if you buy a new Android device and plug it into your existing one, then the keys will actually be copied from the old device to the new device, which sounds like a nice user convenience, but I'm really not certain that this is the thought process that results in that. It does also yeah. mean that if someone's able to compromise the um, device transfer protocol, you're going to have a bad time in terms of your device identity being duplicated. So Signal, for instance, had, does not yeah. make use of the platform functionality for this. It has its own transfer protocol built in on top of that. Yeah. That's so, Sesame? Uh, I don't know if it's part of Sesame or if it's an additional okay. thing, but basically um, you need to provide a passphrase on both sides or something. Yep. Um, there's some validation that you're the legitimate user on both ends yep. before that can occur. 
it does a sort of daisy chaining of auth from a prior device to a new device and stuff. It's mm -hmm. quite a nice flow that's evolved over the years. At least for the Android app backup system, that is supposed to be end-to-end -end encrypted. I'm using air, air quotes here. It's not well known the exact properties. And this is like, this is just kind of, I'm going to chalk this up to sort of marketing versus like iCloud is end-to-end -end encrypted, mm -hmm. you know, and they've got more better end-to-end -end encrypted stuff than they used to in, in iCloud storage versus Android and Google and all that stuff. Something I do want to make clear here is that this is purely for the uh, USB cable physical device to device copying. The key ah. store, at least on the Android side, is excluded from the cloud backup. So, um, okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, we're still talking about what's effectively an XML file in the like operating yeah. system, right? Any idiot with ADB shell can also just cat that out. I mean, granted, it's probably. You know who's doing that on your device, right? But like, well, it's constrained by the standard permissions model. So mm -hmm. uh, ADB is not enough. You're not able to read these files as an unprivileged ADB user. You would need to have a rooted phone to be able to get at that. And you know, okay. don't do encryption on a rooted phone. <laughs> that just seems like That's fair. So each device generates a key pair using mm -hmm. the D56 curves. And then the public half is uploaded to Twitter. There's a new API endpoint, key manager, something like that. And it just registers a key. And right now that just appends that to a list of keys. There's another endpoint, you hit that and you just get back some JSON, which lists all the public keys associated with the user ID. And that's okay. an unauthenticated endpoint. Or rather, you may need to demonstrate that you have a valid current Twitter cookie. But you just mm -hmm. hit that, and then you can hit that with any user ID and get the list of their public keys. So, oh, huh. well, uh, I, I guess. Which tells you how many. So then all you see is like a public key and an opaque device ID. The device ID is randomly generated. Right. Device IDs are per user, so there's no risk of collisions here. Like two users okay. could have the same device ID, and that's not a problem. It's only used in reference to a specific user. So that okay. seems OK. But that's it. The keys are not certified in any way. There's no additional metadata around them. And right now, what happens uh, if you want to message someone is your client just looks up the user ID for the user that you want to DM, mm -hmm. hits this endpoint, gets back a list of public keys, and then goes through the ephemeral key generation dance and uses that to do a key exchange for each of those keys with the same huh. ADS key. So it basically, the first message you send in a conversation includes the first client generates this ADS key, and that's just from secure ransom. Like that seems okay mm -hmm. again. Generates that, encrypts the message with that, and then does this key exchange dance mm -hmm. to generate X encrypted conversation keys. So if the recipient has four devices, you're going to generate four encrypted conversation keys, one corresponding to each of the public keys. And then those encrypted things are just included in the message. Uh, not the message content, but in the uh, overall protocol message. Yeah. So that's then uploaded to Twitter servers. The recipient then connects their device to Twitter, downloads their DMs, and sees that there's a new conversation. It's prepended with an E, so it knows it's an encrypted conversation, and so it's displayed separately from, like if you've had a previous conversation with the same person unencrypted, it'll be listed yeah. as two separate conversations. Okay. You open that, it sees the um, set of all the encrypted conversation keys, and each of those has an associated device ID. It finds one that matches its device ID. It does its half of the key exchange dance, and then ends up with an unencrypted conversation key, stores the unencrypted conversation key in a SQL database locally, and will in future look that up rather than doing mm -hmm. this again, and then decrypts the message text. Now, one weirdness here is the encrypted conversation keys are only sent in the first message in a conversation, which means if a user adds an additional device later, they're screwed. They'll never get a copy of the conversation key. You can only read a conversation from the devices that were enrolled huh. at the time that conversation was initiated. It's yeah. actually kind of a interesting property. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of interesting in a this is 
this sounds like a um yeah, like if you phrase it correctly it sounds like a security boundary but yeah. one thing like i said there's never any rejeeing of the aes key and that's what's yeah. bad it thinks you're going to have reuse but this also means that there's no forward secrecy yep if anybody obtains that key at any point in time they can not only decrypt future messages they can decrypt the past messages as well yeah and those messages are stored on twitter servers forever yeah uh, so once you have a valid conversation key you can decrypt the entire history everything going forward everything going backward and in theory everything going forward if you just you know stay quiet and just let people mm -hmm. keep talking one i i i don't like it <laughs> just putting it on the record i don't like it two it occurs to me that there is no contextual commitment in the generating of these keys at all it's just you generate an rng and then you just hand it over under this diffie hellman encrypted first right. message whereas in something like signal you do your diffie hellman and then you use that to seed like a kdf and then you use the output of that kdf um which is like hashing and all this other stuff to generate your aes or at least an aes key to do your aes cbc but also another nice thing about signal you are binding who can generate an AES key to encrypt your messages to the parties who did the Diffie Hellman? That is not the case when they're generating this at all. It's just a random number generator and they just handed it off. Yeah. So that's one bad thing. Two, as you said, there's no forward secrecy. It's the same key indefinitely forever. Whereas with Signal, like they have the double ratchet so that every message you send, you're doing another Diffie Hellman and you're regenerating a key from that. And if you haven't gotten another message from the other party in a while, you do the other part of the double ratchet, which is a symmetric ratchet. And you just keep hashing and like doing changes to the AES key that is derived from the whole context of your session, including who did all these Diffie Hellmans up at the very beginning. And so that Going forward, you have a different key per message. It's bound to the people who set up the session in the first place. And if you keep sending messages forward after a compromise, it will heal, which is post-compromise security. And none of that is present in this protocol. They don't like it. <laughs> yeah. One other thing to note here is that because the encryption key is bound to the conversation, first issue, and this is mentioned in their docs, you can only have a maximum of 10 registered devices. If you have more than 10 huh. devices, then you can't register any new ones. And a browser counts as a device. If you yeah. uh, reinstall the app on your phone, that counts as a new device. So yeah. it's relatively easy to accidentally hit 10. And there's no yeah. way to remove one of them. That's not ideal. Yeah. But my understanding is that in this scenario, the actual conversation key is not bound to the device in any way. It's bound to the conversation. So every device in the conversation is sharing the same conversation key. In Signal, my understanding is that each message is independently encrypted to each recipient device, as mm -hmm. opposed to uh, there just being a different way of key exchange. And that means mm -hmm. that if you revoke a device from your Signal account, mm -hmm. nothing will encrypt messages to that device anymore. So the attacker mm -hmm. only has whatever was on there. Uh, even if they can insert future messages, they don't have the key material they would need to decrypt them. In the Twizzer case, if a device you own is compromised, then even if you revoke access to that, the attacker has your conversation keys and can mm -hmm. continue decrypting the conversations in future with that device, even though trust in that device was revoked, which mm -hmm. you can't currently do. There's, you can do it with curl. You can hit the API and point directly <laughs> unregistered the device. But right now, there's no exposed UI. So yeah. that's not ideal. But I think the real thing, and the thing that is kind of expressly called out in the documentation for this, and one of the things I'm really uncomfortable about here is that the documentation is, to be fair, pretty open and honest about this is not particularly good. The app says that nowhere. There's no mm -hmm. indication in the app that any of these restrictions, any of these constraints apply. Yeah. And unless you're going to go and read this help page, you're not going to see this anywhere. Yep. But there's no way for you to verify the device keys you're encrypting, the conversation keys too. If someone adds a new device 
you don't get notified. If someone's mm. identity changes, you don't get notified. And right now, that's not too much of a problem because of the like, restriction of you can't add a new device because you just won't be sent the conversation keys again. So like, that is maybe not a big deal. But at mm -hmm. the point where you initially register a device, if Twitter were to just um, lie about the recipient's pub key and replace that with one they control, then you've got the opportunity for a musk in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, a musk in the middle sounds very ominous, but I don't know. Sounds like a, both ominous and a Three Stooges sketch at the same time. <laughs> so you have no absolute confidence, or you can't even verify this out of band. This information is just not made visible to you. Mm. You could mm -hmm. hit the endpoint by hand and then read out mm -hmm. public key to someone, but you don't know that the version that's going to be presented to the device is the same as the version that's going yeah. to be presented when you do this curl. Realistically, I don't think anyone was going to go to this trouble maliciously. Uh, I think this would be a, if law enforcement were to demand that they do so, well, then sure, obviously you've got potential for that to be done. Um, yep. But like, that would be a bunch of engineering work and, well, it would be a bunch of engineering work and there would be a risk that if you got it wrong, it would be very noticeable that you were doing this. Um, mm. So whether Twitter could actually achieve that in their current state of engineering is a kind of open question. So given that, Let's say the alternative is presumably like all of these DMs exist in a SQL database and Musk can just run, you know, select star from DMs where user <laughs> equals AOC or something like that, right? Uh, <laughs> so are we, are we better off or? I think this is, like, it's very easy to get sort of stuck in the nexus here. I, in mm -hmm. terms of comparing this to something like Signal, the sense of guarantees you have is much, much weaker. If your threat model is law enforcement or anyone who could compel Twitter to hand stuff over, this mm -hmm. is awful. You should really not be using this at the moment. Mm. But if your threat model is either Twitter gets compromised and the entire database gets stolen, the entire DM database gets stolen by someone, or an insider is just digging through stuff and you know maybe that's Elon, maybe it's not, this is enough to prevent that. It looks like the keys are genuinely keys that exist on the endpoints rather than on Twitter. And in the absence of changing the behavior of the service, there's no way for an attacker to gain access to the key material. So it would be a much more complicated attack than just mm. being able to pull stuff from a database, which right now they would be able to do. Right now, all DMs are, like, with luck, their encrypt is at rest. <laughs> it's, a bunch of hard drives fell out of some servers that were being shipped from Sacramento to Portland, for instance. Right. I would hope that someone would not immediately be able to access a bunch of DMs. But if you had access to Twitter's private environment, then right now you would be able to read basically all DMs ever. Yeah. And or you uh, you have access to admin console and someone from the current ruling government in India just uh, really insists that you have to comply with the new law that they passed and hand over those DMs. Ticky, ticky, tick, 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 tick. Yeah. Just or type into your admin console. You are actually employed by the Saudi government. Yeah, that too. You don't even have to, to, to go that far. You just get employed at Twitter headquarters, yeah. but uh, just uh, yeah, send some I, files back home. I think we like drastically under as a security community underrate the value of like if nothing else moving something from you trust the server and there's a database of everything on the server to you still trust the server but now that database is gone um mm -hmm. is like a big improvement in a lot of of cases yeah i've tried to frame this as this is best than nothing if you are going to be engaging in twitter dms with someone then yeah, if you're able to flip that encryption on, which right now involves you paying eight dollars a month, unless you're oh on god, the iOS I forgot about that. 11, <laughs> uh, then sure, and as long as you're willing to accept that the current model means that if you only have your phone registers and if you lose that phone, then you're going to, at the moment, lose access to all of those existing messages. If those are things you can live with, then yeah. it is absolutely best than nothing. But as other people have suggested, if you're in any way concerned about like actually remaining secure against 
by state level actors, mm. then the best way to use this is to use Twitter encrypted DMs to get someone's signal number and then yeah. and bot the safety number and then transition to signal. Yeah. I think people are more comfortable with ephemerality in texts than some people would like to believe, at least in texts that are associated with some other service. If the service is primarily texting and chatting like WhatsApp or like Signal, I think there's a different kind of expectation. Like people get sad if uh, sometimes the photo you sent them disappears after four weeks, which is my default in Signal. But I think Twitter DMs are a different ball of wax or other DM systems, I think, could tolerate a lot more ephemerality. But that's my personal opinion. But not So the choice not to implement, well, the documentation asserts that not using forward secrecy was a deliberate choice. And it mm. was deliberately to ensure that access to messages could be retained. Now, mm. right now, the implementation means that even though they made, well, whether this is a, we have not seen any indication of what the design goals were. There's no mm -hmm. design document we can look at with a bunch of objectives and then look at does the implementation meet those. There's a promise that some white paper will be released at some point. The lack of forward secrecy could be a, this is hard, let's not do this. And then let's assert, well, actually there's this feature benefit from not doing it, so cool. Mm -hmm. Or it could just be, uh, it's hard, let's not do it. and. Let's pretend that it was for good reasons. Uh, it's impossible from the outside to make that determination. Or it could be, we've never heard of forward secrecy. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so I did email the people involved in this project a week and a half before they launched yeah. and raised several of these concerns and did not hear anything back, which mm -hmm. I, fair. Uh, if I were working for Elon, and suddenly got an email from some people saying, hey, this feature might actually be bad. Maybe you shouldn't launch it. Then I would very much be, uh, I did not receive this email, I suspect. Mm -hmm. I'm reading their help center page. Our customers expect their unencrypted DM history to be stored in the cloud and downloadable on any device they're logged into. Unfortunately, this user experience doesn't work well for secure messaging protocols. That's not true because Signal stores the encrypted messages until they can be delivered. Um, and then when you sync to a new device, there is a syncing of the encrypted messages. Um, and then you process them in order. And that is how you get the forward because all the messages depend on the previous messages before them. And Bob's your uncle, you can regenerate them and do them in a forward secure and close compromise secure manner. Uh, so at the protocol level, that may be possible. At a practical yes. level in Signal, if you add a new machine, then it does not receive, uh, it does not sync any of the old messages from the existing devices. You have to tell it to pair and you either pair, like you not via Signal service, delivery service, you kind of go the other way around. But I don't know if it's actually doing the ratcheting. It has to preserve some session between devices, including like literally the ratcheting session and the message history to continue that forward secure session. There, so there is yep. some of that happening under the hood and doing all of that work is, is work. But the fact that they're saying uh, doesn't work well with forward secure messaging protocols is incorrect. It requires a little bit more work, but it's very doable. I have never synced signal message history between two phones. <laughs> You, I don't know, well, like, uh, and I bet that in this uh, podcast, at most, two out of the four of us have ever done this, if that. <laughs> and we we're never done Multiple it. times, multiple computers and phones. <laughs> yeah, so Thomas and I have, and I don't know, Matthew, have you done this before? Whenever I've, as a new device, it has said uh, old messages are not synchronized to new devices for security reasons. But I use Android. Maybe iOS is a different universe. I use Android and Signal Desktop, so I don't know. Maybe it's a Signal Desktop thing. But. I just get a new phone, and then my security number changes, and then no one cares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there is, you know, some truth to the fact that maintaining forward secrecy is hard. If you if you say like cloud synchronized messages, also kind of implies like you don't have the other device sitting around in a USB cable or a Bluetooth connection. Mm. There are solutions here, but like. 
I, I don't think what Signal does is feasible. Also, I really do not want to think about Twitter trying to implement stuff in SGX. That, well, you don't even, <laughs> you can do this without SGX. Signal chose to use SGX to underpin their secure backup thing with pass keys and stuff. Yeah. That's the cat is already out of the bag. Yeah. Who you're talking to on Twitter. There's, there's no, there's a, I mean, it's, it, mentioning right is that like I, w the whole time you know, we're comparing this to signal and it's like there's not really much of a comparison right no, yeah like, no <laughs> most of the you know, is just that law enforcement people can't ask who were you talking to right forget the message content right like just a huge amount of the engineering decisions and the ux compromises and stuff all those ux compromises they're making it's to avoid answering the question the metadata question you know what yeah. users you're talking to right which the, the reason for that is that metadata is often as valuable as yes. the mess, you know, an evil ex-partner or something like that, that working at Twitter that's, you know, of using their, their ex-spouse or whatever, right? Like mm -hmm. the list of who they're talking to is probably enough for them to, you know, uh, you know, for them to do harassment stuff, right? The content yep. might not be as important to them as like, d did you talk to your doctor or this other person or whatever, right? So yep, yep. like some of the most important stuff that we're concerned about, Twitter isn't even touching. Yep, not even. Yep. Yeah, not that the user in the app will be able to distinguish this, but I will credit their help center article that says these are encrypted, but they are not quote end to end encrypted because of the uh the musk in the middle of it all. So, you know, metadata security aside, which even WhatsApp doesn't have a good uh story to. WhatsApp, that's kind of where in the ranking system, if you want to rank Signal at the top, and then WhatsApp underneath is because they do have a lot of access to this metadata about who is talking to whom and who is in a group because they don't have group membership privacy from WhatsApp, the service, and that can be subpoenaed. Yeah, Twitter's not even touching that. And they're not even calling it end-to-end -end encrypted DMs, but they are they are encrypted. So it's better yeah, than not. In a very technical sense, they are end-to-end -end encrypted in the sense that so. The keys are genuinely on the endpoints, not somewhere else. But you've then got the problem that Twitter could right now just become one of the ends. Yep. If they want yeah, to. I mean, that's like, that is like yep. the, the classic breakdown of yep. end end encrypted messaging. It's like, it's, it's the, it's forward secrecy is not the number one problem in messaging, right? It's, you know, key identity and group member. Ship are, are like the number one problem in that. Right. It's the reason why things that are supposedly end to end end up not being end to end. It turns out the server can just add themselves to groups or register themselves as a key, and then all the rest of the mechanism is irrelevant, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's actually interesting to talk about the group aspects of this a little because the mm. architecture they've chosen here, the obvious way to extend this to support group messages, which it currently doesn't, is what. The behavior in Twitter at the moment is if you're added to a group, then you potentially have access to all the messages in there as well. And right now, that would imply, well, you're going to need to share the existing conversation key with new members of the group, which because of lack of forward secrecy and because nothing is end-to-end, -end, uh, not sorry, because uh, none of the keys are user-specific, adding one new member to a group would then result in that member having a key that could defer to old messages, even if you haven't forwarded the old messages to them. So it seems hard to kind of imagine how to extend the choices they've made here into supporting more complex use cases. The set of decisions here was fairly pragmatic in terms of use the simplest set of crypto possible that will achieve the, I want to talk to one other person in something that you could kind of squint at and say, I guess, it's end-to-end -end encrypted in theory, if not in spirit. Mm. Uh, but extend to do everything else people want in an encrypted messenger is going to be extremely hard without basically rewriting all of this from scratch. Yep. It, it seems like a basic thing you can say about this system where there's like an unauthenticated, you know, P-curve Diffie-Hellman exchange to like send things. It's like the most naive possible way of doing public key encryption with ECDH and it's like a single GCM key for you know a forever you know DM session it seems like one thing you can probably say about the system is that no cryptography engineer reviewed this design 
So, David, um, you, tell, you, 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 you two are more qualified than I am to make that claim because I am not a cryptography engineer. But my guess is that no cryptography engineer reviewed this. They might have looked at the code and said, you know, the way you're doing analysis is going to be fine, although this is terrible and it's going to blow up eventually. Uh, but nobody looked at that design and said, this is how we should do it. Like, there are just basic things that you would do differently if you were being cryptographically competent. So the night before this feature launched, Chris Stanley, who is technically a SpaceX employee, run a Twitter employee, but it's currently leading large parts of Twitter's security work. He's the guy who the photos from the first all nighter that uh, Twitter 2.0 pulled. The guy who's in the front taking a selfie with a bunch of people wearing an Occupy Mars shirt. He said on Twitter that this had been audited by Trail of Bits and that uh, Dan Gundo yeah. was an absolute badass. Platformer, today's platformer that just came yeah. out, actually says that Twitter sources indicate that that audit hasn't started yet. He lays a sort of backtrack and says the audit wasn't finished yet, but it sounds like they launched yep. it without any external audit. Yep. But uh, um, oh. in terms of uh, choices that if you, uh, if you had a cryptographic engineer actually implementing this thing, they are using Bouncy Castle, broken KDF two bytes generator. Um, I mean, hold on, J just to start with, right? Like you wouldn't have a single GCM key for the entire length of a conversation. Correct. No, you would not. You just know, like you can, at the very least, you can have a counter. You can keep a counter or something or hash in previous messages in the fucking session or the context and to help generate next keys. Like you don't have to do double ratchet, but you can do something involving a KDF. <laughs> this is this is zero ratchet, right? Like this is, this is, yeah. this, this, I mean, it, you know, it's like we establish a key once and then we live with it forever, right? But like, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to like, do a key exchange, right? The you, whole premise could, of double ratchet is like you, you, you do key exchanges every possible time you can conceivably come up with through a key exchange, right? You could even so, be a like, for starters. Like, yeah, you could just be like the TLS session, which is like, oh, we do a dumb Diffy Hellman, and then you use a KDF to generate from that shared secret an actual AES key that's bound to the session, but they didn't even do that. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying, like, from the, the design documentation I've seen, th this isn't a way of saying the design is terrible or that whoever reviewed it is not competent, right? It's just if you are a specialist cryptography engineer, there's a bunch of things that you would do in a design that aren't here. Right? Like the simplest yeah, yeah. possible thing you can say is like, there's no key separation. <laughs> they, yeah. they didn't put any like domain. I, I, I think you're being a little harsh, Thomas. Twitter has successfully rebuilt a system with the same properties as Matrix in far less time. Whoa. <laughs> it's, again, it's not really a critique of the security of the protocol, but we've been telling people for two years now that if you want to appear cryptographically sophisticated, all you have to do is sprinkle domain constants all over everything, and then people will assume you got things right. They didn't even do that. If they were listening to our podcast, I don't I don't think anyone at Twitter HQ is listening to our podcast. We don't charge for this. They could just listen to it and take our advice and not credit us. Yeah, I feel like every third episode, we spend at least 10 minutes explaining how to build an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging system or various aspects of it. Catnip, baby. <laughs> so one of the consequences of the browser being a device from this perspective is anytime you log into Twitter, in a browser, if you've not previously logged into it, it generates and registers a key pair. And that key pair is then going to be sufficient to be able to gain access to any conversations that are initiated after you did that. Mm -hmm. So on mobile devices, you know, we have a reasonable amount of app to app separation. If I get a compromised calculator app onto your phone, that can't just read data belonging to other applications. On yeah. desktop, that's basically not true. If yeah. I can get any malware onto your system, that can read out any data that is stored in your browser's local storage. And that's going to include this key material. That's going to include any existing conversation keys that are stashed locally. That's going to include the key pair that you could then use to reconstruct them even if they weren't. Yeah. And now the same, to be fair, is true if you're using Signal Desktop or the online version of WhatsApp anywhere. But yeah. I think there's a distinction here in that that's a very conscious thing that you do. And I don't think the security trade-offs are necessarily particularly well communicated. But also, if I then unregister my Signal desktop app, then what stuff in the past may have been compromised, nothing in the future is going to be. Whereas in the Twitter design, that's not the case. 
Yeah. Which means like if I'm logged in to Twitter on any machine that I then lose or mm -hmm. which gets taken away from me at immigration, all those conversation keys potentially have to be considered compromised. And yep. there's no way to force key regeneration. Yeah. That conversation, like if I'm DMing someone, if one of my machines is stolen and they keep DMing me, there's no way for me yep. to stop that being done with a key that is now potentially under malicious control. Yep. Also, if the browser, every time you log in as a new key, does that mean if you log in to like a browser 10 times because you you're lost done. your cookie for whatever reason, you're just yep. done? I feel yeah, like done. I, I feel like I log into Twitter like at least like three times a week on... If it's a browser, right now logging out doesn't delete the data. <laughs> That's, again, unless there's a caveat somewhere in the docs. But so if you open an incognito session and log into Twitter, then yeah, every time you do that, that's a new device. If you do it in the same browser without, uh, I, I'm sure if you do this in Brave or something, then sure, it probably behaves in some sort of very privacy preserving way. So privacy preserving, you lose the ability to send encrypted DMs quite quickly. Hmm. But uh, in Chrome or whatever, uh, logging out and logging in again should use the same key pair. As long as you don't clear it. As long as you don't clear it, local storage. Yeah. 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 Hmm. I, uh, I blow away storage frequently, so yeah. But then again, I used to be a web developer. I think it's pretty clear that we are probably not the target audience for this feature. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, but it makes a, oh God, this people are gonna run into failure modes with this if they try to use it. Probably n nobody is the target audience for this feature, right? Like oh, the, there, the there, isn't a real, there isn't a real threat model of this target. The target audience is make Elon happy. Elon is the type of audience. Um, <laughs> being able to tell Elon, yeah, you can take this box and these messages will be encrypted is basically the entire story here. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I kind of am sad that they did announce the weakness. Well, obviously, I'm glad that they did document the fact that this is weak and Elon was sort of forced to admit that it was weak because we did mm. have the opportunity to actually hold a gun to Elon's head and force him to read people's DMs. Not that I'm suggesting we should actually do so without consent from all involved <laughs> but this has like this has kind of kind of similar security dynamics to using like a good password hash right like it's not so much a protection for twitter's users as much as it is a protection for twitter like it's yeah. it's got to be comforting for them to know that they don't have uh that, that it's become harder to get people's dms or it will be when the features rolled out and on by default right it's not gonna be on by default it's only for twitter blue subscribers <laughs> and you have to. Why are we talking about this? It's only available for Twitter Blue subscribers. It's not even on by default for Twitter Blue subscribers, if I understand correctly. So it's like layers and layers of like you have to make a specific choice to even get access to this. Okay, I guess we'll call it encrypted DM feature. So, so what they really what they've really reinvented here is Telegram. <laughs> Technically, it's not even Twitter Blue subscribers. It's verified users, which is slightly larger than Twitter Blue subscribers for the most part. If you're part of a verified organization, you get one. But it turns out something I haven't realized. When you subscribe to Twitter Blue, there's then still a several day period where you are paying money, but you are not verified. <laughs> and some things being done in the background to decide whether or not to verify you. But you can pay money without getting this feature. I, I'm sad. Well, thank God Stephen King can finally send an encrypted message to LeBron James. <laughs> I'm I'm not sad. I, I, I you know I, I'm I'm like I'm receptive to you know to Matthew's argument at the beginning here about you know if you're if if you're worried about somebody breaking into Twitter and getting their data, it's become harder to get some DMs now. Like, whatever, but like yeah. don't use don't use the what am I trying to don't use DMs. They're bad. Like yeah. the the best thing Twitter could possibly do here is just stop having DMs. It's like it's a malignant feature. It shouldn't exist anywhere. So supposedly there's there there are DMs on Mastodon. I I wouldn't know. I refuse to click the button, right? But like uh, yeah, the DMs on Mastodon are basically something that just controls the visibility of the message by default. They're not actually yeah. um one to one in any way. Perfect. Any yeah, don't they're a very different animal on Mastodon. <laughs> it's basically a public message that is not by default displayed. Yeah, don't click that button, Thomas. That's that's really excellent look blue sky exists now we can stop pretending that mastodon is good yeah all right 
thanks, Matthew. Is there anything that we missed in this journey? No, I, I think really, um, like saying this is bad is, it really depends on your threat model. I, I think, mm. I think the word that to me seems most appropriate for describing any of this is naive. It's, mm. it's not great. It's not well thought through, but it's assuming that there is any kind of actual coherent design goal, then this plausibly meets it. But mm. what worries me is not whether this does what it's supposed to do. It's whether the people who end up using it understand what it's supposed to do and what yes. it actually does. And I think Elon's description for an extended period of time, including on national TV, that this was intended to prevent Twitter from being able to read messages. And the initial implementation is really a long way from that. Yeah. Means that there is a risk that people are going to place trust in this, that it should not be there. And being, I think there's a wider conversation about overpromising on security and privacy features that um, society hasn't really had yet. Yep. And the degree to which, from my perspective, this should be considered grossly unethical. Yeah. On the other hand, this is a kind of, well, okay, Twitter DMs may be horrifically insecure in various ways, but the people who are most likely to trust them are the sorts of people who I would be most enthusiastic about suddenly unexpectedly discovering that law enforcement has their DMs. <laughs> who can say whether it's good or bad? <laughs> yeah, 100% agree. And I personally think end-to-end uh, -end encryption should be the default for private communications, which DMs ostensibly are. But, oh well. <laughs> Matthew, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. It has been a pleasure. Security, cryptography, whatever, is a side project from Deirdre Connolly, Thomas Patachik, and David Adrian. Our editor is Nettie Smith. You can find the podcast on Twitter at SCWPod and the hosts on Twitter at Durham Crushulum, at TQBF, and at David C. Adrian. You can buy merchandise at merch.securitycryptographywhatever.com. Thank you for listening.